Independence Day in Guatemala. President Lucas Garcia presides over his small country's formal and solemn celebrations. Indian onlookers watch a parade deeply rooted in Guatemala's colonial past, a distinctively Latin American scene. Behind the bulletproof glass, a strongman president inspects the pride of his military forces. Guatemala is not a dictatorship. President Garcia next year completes a four-year term of office, yet democracy is a thin coating here. Behind the facade, claim its opponents, is one of the most ruthlessly oppressive regimes in Central America. Guatemala is the third largest of the small Central American republics. Bordered to the north and west by Mexico, one of its southern neighbors is the strife-torn El Salvador. The guerrilla war in El Salvador has dominated recent press coverage of the region, but unrest is growing here in Guatemala. Its internal war may soon rival that of its neighbor. This nation of just over seven million people faces an uncertain and possibly bloody future. This colorful, largely military ceremony of today seems trivial when set against the country's rich and glorious past. These are the ruins at Tikal in the north of the country, one of the centers of Mayan civilization. This culture flourished from the third to the 16th centuries. It produced brilliant achievements in architecture, astronomy, and mathematics. Tikal, one of the oldest Mayan cities, is also the most impressive. The detail on the stonework is merely one facet of the artistic achievements this culture produced. They're still discovering Mayan temples and palaces here in the dense jungle. Radar has pinpointed a vast canal system which drained the swamps. But there is still no hint as to why the Mayan cities fell into ruin before the Spanish conquest. The history of the Guatemalans has been less glorious in the colonial and modern periods. Political turmoil has marked the past 150 years of Guatemalan history. Simón Bolívar is commemorated as a champion of independence from Spain. But independence did not lead to the liberalism and democracy of which men like Bolivar dreamed. A program of social reform was initiated after the Second World War, but land reforms were bitterly opposed by the country's landowners. A coup in 1954 brought them to an end. Today, Guatemala's politics are dominated by the extreme right. Mario Sandoval is the favorite to become the next president to succeed Lucas Garcia. A former vice president, he's closely associated with the country's military and business leaders. He leads the ultra-conservative national freedom movement. Their flags carry the national colors as a symbol of their nationalism. In his rallies, Sandoval seeks to whip up anti-communist fervor. Sandoval's message to the electorate is a simple one. He believes that Central America is the decisive battleground in the fight against communism. According to his view, if the communists capture Central America, the rest of the world is at risk. He pledges that if he becomes president, he'll put an end to the Red Menace. The message of the National Liberation Movement is delivered by its vice presidential candidate. Leader Sandoval is the victim of a throat ailment which prevents him from giving public speeches. In the extreme atmosphere of Guatemalan politics, the center parties have been squeezed out. 
In the name of fighting communism, all opposition is being persecuted. 80 Christian Democrat Party members have been assassinated in the past 18 months. The political violence is taking a heavy toll on the economy. Guatemala used to have the most diversified and strongest economy in the region, but tourism has declined dramatically. Now there is only enough international reserves to pay for three months' imports. It's believed there can be no hope for the economy until the violence subsides. Here, close to Guatemala City, the government still has firm control. On this large landed estate, migrant workers sort and bag coffee beans from this season's crop, producing over 40% of the country's export earnings. Guatemala is an underdeveloped, primarily agricultural country. Wealthy landowners control most of the productive land and produce the export crops. A brief attempt at agricultural reform after the Second World War failed. Since then, peasant communities have found their land falling prey to landowner encroachment. Most peasants do not now own enough land to support their families. Every season, they become migrant workers on the large estates. The work is hard, 10 to 12 hours a day, and pay and conditions can be appalling. To work the estates, migrants are recruited in squads of 20 to 300 people from the same village. Often the recruiter will pocket the migrants' entire wages, owed to him because of loans at 100% interest. The system is almost self-perpetuating. Officially, there are laws controlling conditions, but regulations are ignored, and a bribe quickly diverts any inquiries. The situation on the land is providing the unrest which guerrilla movements are seeking to exploit. Traditionally, the Indians of Central and South America are extremely distrustful of outsiders. A guerrilla movement in Bolivia, led by Che Guevara, failed dismally because it failed to win Indian support. Here in Guatemala, however, the situation appears to be different. The guerrilla organizations, like the guerrilla army of the poor, have made a real attempt to recruit among the Indians. And because the land question is such a burning issue, the Indians appear to be offering support. As the Indians turn to the guerrilla movements, the countryside is becoming a battleground. The guerrilla army of the poor claims to have occupied 70 villages for short periods in the past year. Their revolutionary program of agrarian reform and social justice has struck a responsive chord among the Indians. Other factors are at work too. The arrival of cheap transistor radios has brought to an end the Indian centuries-old isolation. Guatemala bears the hallmarks of a country fit for a full-scale guerrilla insurgency. Guatemala City, the capital, has all the stark third world contrasts between rich and poor. The top 2% of the population is estimated to enjoy some 25% of the national income. The houses of the elite occupy the hilly suburbs. On the valley floor, the children of the slums play soccer. This is the El Limon quarter of Guatemala City. Most of the people here are peasants. They fled to the city after massive earthquakes in 1976 destroyed their villages. A million people were made homeless in this catastrophe from which Guatemala still hasn't recovered. Most of these slum dwellers are Indian. They're among the 50% of the population who receive only 10 to 15% of the national income. Slums like El Limon are the breeding ground for urban terrorism. If this were linked to the rural guerrilla movements, it could create a conflagration greater than that in El Salvador. 
¿Cómo es un botón para acá? ¿Por cualquier Por cualquier cosa. Las cámaras. To Guatemala's increasing unrest, President Garcia has applied stern medicine. He took office in July 1978, pledging to restore peace. But the level of violence from both left and right wing groups has increased. The president has been accused of being involved with the activities of several right-wing paramilitary units. These units have launched an assassination campaign against the center and the left. To counter claims of repression, President Garcia has launched a number of social programs. Here he outlines the results of a literacy campaign. <laughs> The literacy drive has been a pet project of the president. He claims that over 400,000 people have been involved in the drive in its first six months. Proof, the president claims, of his regime's reformist intentions. In the past few months, President Garcia has also made several forays into the countryside. These occasions are used to meet the people and point to the projects the government is financing. Everywhere, security measures are obvious and elaborate. The president is always aware that the tenure of Central American leaders can be short and bloody. On this occasion, President Garcia has flown into Esquintla, 50 miles south of the capital. Because of increasing guerrilla activity in the countryside, the whole area has been sealed off. Last year, the president was seriously embarrassed by the revelation that his Minister of the Interior had secretly been a member of the Army of the Poor for four years. His vice president also resigned because of right-wing terrorism and repression of Indians. With dissension within his own cabinet, the president may be aware that the social showpieces like this hospital may be too little, too late. However, the Guatemalan military and ruling elite still appear to believe that dissension can be stamped out by increased repression. Everywhere in Latin America, the Catholic Church is an essential part of the pattern, and Guatemala is no exception. From high officials to peasants, the vast majority of Guatemalans are fervent Catholics. But the church itself is not united. The country's social and political tensions have divided it into two. On the one hand, the church hierarchy who generally support the government, and on the other hand, a growing number of priests who sympathize with the aims, if not the methods, of the guerrillas. Some of those priests have paid with their lives. For whatever the spiritual influence of the church, real power in Guatemala lies elsewhere. Guatemala's security forces are well-armed, well-trained, and feared. Apart from the army, there are several military-style police forces, and all of them, it's alleged, are involved in human rights violations of some kind or another. This is the power that's kept the government in office throughout years of increasing guerrilla opposition. Intimidation of peasants, assassination of labor leaders, and the maintenance of a general atmosphere of fear and terror. Such are the allegations laid against them by human rights workers. The security forces deny the allegations, but they do admit they're tough because they say they have to be. Guatemalan guerrillas first hit the world headlines back in the early 70s 
for the kidnapping of West German ambassador Count von Spreti. Since then, there have been numerous kidnappings and other guerrilla coups. Their exploits have served as models for others. This hostage drama three years ago was staged by factory workers demanding better conditions from the Swiss-owned company that employed them. Over the years, there's been a steady stream of incidents where ordinary Guatemalans, not guerrillas, showed their hostility to the government. This riot, again three years ago, began when students and workers objected to government plans to increase bus fares in Guatemala City. It was put down with such ferocity that eight people were killed and 150 injured. Police brutality or law and order. The government insists it's dealing with criminals and subversives, but many international observers disagree. Amnesty International, the international human rights watchdog, has compiled a report that makes many serious charges. It claims that in the three years since General Garcia came to power, nearly 5,000 Guatemalans have been seized without warrant and killed. Several hundred more have been assassinated after being branded as subversives. The government admits that assassinations take place, but blames right-wing death squads over which it has no control. Amnesty, however, claims that many of the killings originate in secret offices in an annex of Guatemala's National Palace, under the direct control of the President of the Republic. However true those allegations, it's undeniable that Guatemala's president does have the kind of power that puts the country's democratically elected Congress very much in the shade. The United States keeps a close watch on Guatemala. The Reagan administration is worried by increasing guerrilla activity against President Lucas Garcia from a united left. But the Americans do not support Guatemala on all issues. For example, Belize, the former British colony which was granted independence in September. The Americans do not support Guatemalan claims to the territory. And as long as Belize remains free from Cuban influence, its newly won independence will be given American blessing. The Guatemalans have closed the border with Belize in protest at Belizean independence, which they refuse to recognize. The Guatemalans base their claims to part or all of Belize on events long ago when the Spanish Empire broke up. The military leadership is also concerned that when the British leave Belize, the communist-backed guerrillas might find safe havens across the border. For the time being, however, British troops have been asked to remain in Belize in support of the fledgling Belize Defence Force in case a military threat from Guatemala materialises. Guatemala, of course, says it bears no hostility towards the people of Belize, as Foreign Minister Rafael Castillo Valdez explains. Yes, according to our constitution, not only the Belizeans, but all of the Central American inhabitants are considered as Guatemalans. All they have to say is that they will take residence in Guatemala and that they would like to be Guatemalans, and our laws provide for that. Now, am I right in thinking that you would rather that the British stayed there for the time being until an agreement is reached, rather than give independence right away? I do not know why you understand that, because I have mentioned nothing in that regard. So, as far as you're concerned, you're... As far as I'm concerned, as a Guatemalan, the problems of these territories will begin to have a solution when all foreigners will go back to wherever they belong. Yeah. Uh, we feel that um, the British came here several centuries ago. I think that the only good thing about this happening is that they will go back. And I surely hope that they will go back and try to solve the problems of Ireland, the problems of Liverpool, the problems of London, Manchester, whatever. Finally, Minister, will you invade Belize? We are not savages. We want to make it very clearly. The, we are a straight descendants from the Mayans. 
And we are so proud to say that Mayans were never killers, never butchers, never invaders. I think that uh, you know as much as we know about where we come from. And uh, we believe that through peace we can build what uh, you have seen in Guatemala that we have been building. How then do you and, uh, see the future in Belize? <clears throat> I think that that is mainly for the Belizeans to see what future they can, uh, they can work out. For what um, respects to Guatemala, the Belizean people represents only 2% of the Guatemalan population. And uh, they have a good number of problems which uh, I'm sure that the Belizeans have not created. I would say that the responsible for that territory, who has been because of these acts of invasion who has been the British Empire, the problem that may be there may be because the British were there. No. Let, me, let me say that uh, whatever you may see in Guatemala, which is uh, worthwhile looking at and admiring at, has been done either by nature or by the Guatemalans. That the British have, the British or the Americans or the Russians or any foreigner, including the Spaniards, have done very little for these peoples. And um, we Guatemalans feel very strongly that the only way that a small nation like ours will have a, an opportunity to grow in the way that we have been growing is if we have a chance to do things by ourselves. Doing things by themselves isn't the kind of policy that's going to give much reassurance either to the Belizeans or to the Americans. If it means Guatemala will continue its territorial claims on Belize, then the future certainly does look unsettled. There are other reasons for worry. Despite the wide publicity that's been given to the charges over human rights, most of Guatemala's middle classes are solidly behind the government. And with that kind of backing, plus the admittedly guarded support of Washington, the government just doesn't see why it should make any serious concessions to its opponents. Changes needed are, in fact, less than have already taken place in Nicaragua or are expected in El Salvador. The essentials are protection of Indians from land grabbers, more breathing room for the moderate parties of the center and left, and a halt to government-inspired violence. If progress could be made on these issues, there's a chance that the guerrillas might be isolated, and that could put Guatemala on the path to evolution rather than revolution. On present form, though, there seems little prospect of breaking away from the extremism that has cursed Guatemala for so long.